Mike, I'd love for you to take a few minutes and just talk about that. You represent so many employers and the voice of the employer. Share some of your passion about how employers really are the instigator of change in this industry and need to be. Well, you know, when, when I think that I've been in the industry an awful long time, and when I look at the changes that have occurred in the industry, they have often started because employers led the movement, whether it was cost containment or managed care or consumerism or quality. Uh, employers really helped to lead that charge. Uh, an overdue charge is the movement, the, the reemergence of primary care to be central to our strategies. Um, you know, as we uh, move to more open access uh, PPO type strategies, we got away from encouraging people to have a primary care physician and to develop a relationship uh, that was more longitudinal in nature and, and to get the type of care that led to better health and better outcomes downstream. Uh, what, but there were a, a number of um, great examples of leading primary care practices that were getting outstanding results uh, across their patient population and, and frankly, good, good results for the patients, but equally good results, in fact, excellent results for purchasers, for people who are paying the bills. And, and it wasn't because they were spending less on primary care. Let's put that very clear. It wasn't because they were spending less on primary care, because they were spending more on primary care. Yes. They were focusing on key ingredients. And, and, I, and I've always said, you know, you don't just spend more on primary care, you invest in primary care in the right things. And so one is to have enhanced access, you know, be available when people need the care. And that means having coverage after hours or on the weekends and things like that. There's, there's spending more time with the patients. You know, our typical primary care relationship today is so stressed that they're seeing so many patients, they don't have a chance to build the relationship that's really required to create that longitudinal and, and uh, relationship that we're looking for. Uh, I think another area that we look at is getting beyond the transactional uh, issue of treating the symptoms that present and thinking with a more longitudinal relationship about how do we encourage people to have the right health behaviors over time and work collaboratively with our patients to do so. Very core in our view, and I will say this, I probably say it twice a week, you know, there is no advanced primary care if you have an integrated behavioral health. Yeah. Uh, you can't treat a whole person without understanding the social and, and, and mental dimensions of that individual. And, and so we are very strong advocates that behavioral health integration is core to an advanced primary care model. And then very important is the power of primary care when it is empowered to not just uh, treat the patient better, but also be wise in where they refer. Yeah. And, uh, in that way, they, they influence the entire spend of the employer and they can have a huge impact. All of this is empowered by a couple of things. One is infrastructure. You know, uh, you need to have the right infrastructure to manage yourself, to examine things with more of a population focus, gaps in care focus, all of those things. And then secondly, payment. You know, the payment has to support the model. If you, if you pay under the traditional way, you're going to get the traditional care. You've got to be thinking with, with a, uh, and, and frankly, many of these models have moved to more of a prepaid uh, model that is adequate to support what we're looking for in primary care. Nice. Well, and you just brought up so many of the elements, as you talked about what the employer wants, to what Dr. Mark, you built in your peak med primary care practice. Talk a little bit about relationship and how you can take more time with the patient and how you play that navigator. To your first point, Daryl um, and Mike, the, the patient-doctor relationship is a sacred relationship and it always has been. Um, that sacred relationship starts to uh, fracture when the relationship goes from a 30-minute appointment to a 20 minute appointment to a five minute appointment. And then the experience is absolutely horrible. You know, 30 minutes in the waiting room, five minutes for a doctor. And God forbid you want to talk about two or three things in that one meeting. It's just damn near impossible to get it done. So getting, you know, that's how I practice medicine for quite a while. 
um, which led me to get burnt out and frustrated and tired and said, there has to be a better way um, of doing this and practicing medicine for the next 30, 40, 50 years. Um, and in order to understand it, I think you really needed to, you need to unpack the economics of healthcare, specifically primary care. And um, that was the spawning of peak med really. Um, and I would say that, you know, I'm probably gen two in this phase of advanced primary care. I mean, you know, advanced primary care is the catchphrase today, you know, before it was, you know, patient centered medical home. Now it's advanced primary care. And I'm sure another couple of years, it'll be called something different. But the foundation is, how do we redefine what the doctor-patient relationship looks like? How do we change the payment system inside of that doctor-patient relationship? And then how do we actually start moving away from sick care into healthcare, right? Let's move into prevention. Let's move into actually not allowing a patient to get discovered at, um, at, you know, a fourth stage cancer or a third stage cancer. Survivability goes down drastically when it's discovered in stage three or four versus stage one or two. The money that's spent on stage three or four is quadruple what it is in stage one or two. So the only way you start getting to that place is, is changing how we practice medicine. And in order to do that, you need time. And then you need a patient that trusts their doctor. And the only way that works is if you um, redefine how we're structuring and how we're performing inside of primary care. Economics is what drives how that works. You know, it's not the doctor's fault in a fee for service environment that has to see 25 or 30 patients a day. It's the reimbursement model. It's there's not a patient, there's not a doctor that I've ever met that wants to see 30 people a day. Yeah. <laughs> I've never known either. <laughs> it's miserable, you know. Yeah, it's gotta be. Um, but you have to get the economics in such that you can see eight or 10 patients a day and still have the same economics to support your practice and support your staff and support the growth of a healthy organization. And that's, you know, DPC. The whole goal is you have to attack primary care to Mike's point in a much different way than we have historically. And you have to actually spend more money in primary care so that you spend less money in the hospital, less money in the ERs and urgent cares and the outpatient surgical centers because your primary care doctor is managing them at a much higher level and more efficiently at the end of the day. And more, most importantly, when you have the time to do that, we have steerability to those specialists and those hospital systems that have higher quality at a lower cost because we know what we're trying to do for our employers. You know, I, I tell people that, um, you know, we, we're a service industry. And if our service isn't providing a value to our customer, they're going to fire us. Whereas in a fee for service, I could, I can give you the crappiest care you can imagine. I'm still going to get paid and you're not firing me. You're just going to come back because you have to. Yeah. We look at primary care in a different light. You know, they, they pay for us. So we have to show value um, from a, uh, from a primary care standpoint, from a healthcare standpoint, we have to show value in cost. You know, people are paying for this in addition to what they're paying on the insurance side. And at the end of the day, um, if we don't do our job, then we're just gonna get fired. So we're very proud to, you know, have 99% retention of our employer lives. I think One Medical has, you know, 97% retention of their employers, you know. Wow. National promoter scores in the 70s and 80s, which is unheard of in healthcare. Um, you know, it's it's redefining this thing, and employers are driving the conversation at this point because they're sick of the 10, 15, 20 percent year over year premiums. I think innately, all of uh, everybody that goes into primary care, they're mainly relationship based human beings. Um, you know. We didn't go into surgery for a reason. We didn't go into radiology for a reason. Um, we went into primary care knowing we're not going to be the highest compensated physicians, but we like relationships. We like people and we like having kind of, you know, a jack of all trades and a master of none at the end of the day. So I don't think it takes a whole lot of um, teaching to get a primary care provider to see eight or 10 people a day and do it exceptionally well. I always said, you just have to, you just have to give them a platform to where they can practice medicine the way they want to and get out of their way.
because they will shock you every single time. They will, they will surpass everything that you've asked them to do. I think the, the important part is um, almost deconditioning the providers that have been in the system for so long that you have to tell them it's okay. It's okay. <laughs> it's okay to slow down. Yeah. Read, go look at, you know, go to up to date, go read about something you haven't been able to and do it while the patient is sitting with you because you have an hour if you need to. Yeah. And the patients, they don't expect you to know everything. They actually like the idea that you're investigating something and putting your medical knowledge to work and being able to interpret that back in an intelligent way that's understandable. So it, it's about really um, deconditioning a provider to allow them to go back to practicing good clinical medicine without time restrictions of having to, you know, be in the, in the carousel of seeing 30 people a day. Where there is that concentration, you are seeing it over and over that uh, these relationships become an extension of the, the value of the employer themselves to the employee. Uh, you know, they're, they're built around a culture of caring, built around a culture of, of helping uh, their employees uh, be the best they can be. And, and um, some of the more sophisticated employers are actually actively engaged thinking about, you know, how to mitigate downstream costs too, knowing that the investment in the primary care is the way to mitigate the need for downstream costs. But when it does occur, they're activated there. 